Section 2 Americans from Europe Chapter 2 The Irish The Irish were the first great ethnic minority in American cities. Much of their early history set the classic pattern of the newcomer to the urban economy and society. When the Irish began arriving in the 1820s, and especially after their massive immigration in 1840s and 1850s, they began at the bottom of the urban occupational ladder, the men as manual laborers, the women as maids. They crowded into the poorest quality housing, far worse than slum housing today, and lived under conditions that readily communicated disease, fire, and such social problems as violence, alcoholism, and crime. The native public's reaction to the Irish included moving out of neighborhoods en masse as the immigrants moved in, stereotyping them all as drunkards, brawlers, and incompetents, and raising employment barriers exemplified in the stock phrase, no Irish need apply. The jobs the Irish did find were those considered too hard, too menial, too dirty, or too dangerous by others. The hardships of their lives may be summed up in a 19th century observation that you seldom see a gray-haired Irishman. Their average life expectancy was 40 years. With painful slowness, the Irish rose over the generations. Their first successes were in politics, where some achieved influential positions by the middle of the 19th century, and within a few decades became dominant in big city political machines in Boston, New York, and other metropolitan areas. These successes brought prosperity and prominence to a few, but had little immediate impact on the economic conditions of most Irish Americans. As late as the 1890s, most of the men were still laborers and most of the women domestic servants. Even the most famous Irish American family, the Kennedys, rose slowly at first. The first Kennedy arrived from Ireland in, 18, Ireland in 1848, a laborer, and lived and died a laborer. His son achieved through modest success, sorry, his son achieved enough modest success to send the grandson to college, and that grandson, Joseph P. Kennedy, made the fortune that enabled the great-grandsons to achieve fame and to become a tragic legend in American politics. For most Irish Americans, what has been achieved after more than a century has been a rise to the level of other Americans in income, occupations, IQ, and other indicators of socioeconomic position. Social acceptance came slowly and generally followed their achievements rather than being a precondition. A more genial public image of the Irishman replaced the harsh earlier stereotypes. How it all happened is a long and complex story that began, for most, in peasant cottages in Ireland. Ireland. A French traveler in the early 19th century returned from a trip that included America and Ireland and wrote, I have seen the Indian in his forests and the Negro in his chains and thought, as I contemplated their pitiable condition, that I saw the very extreme of human wretchedness but I did not then know the condition of unfortunate Ireland. This was not mere rhetoric. Slaves in the United States had a longer life expectancy than peasants in Ireland, ate better, and lived in cabins built of sturdier materials, with more space, ventilation, and privacy than the huts of contemporary Irish peasants. It is unnecessary to attempt to say who was worse off on net balance, the mere fact that such a comparison could be made indicates something of the desperate poverty of Irish peasants in the 1830s. While the Irish were legally free, they lived as a conquered people in their own land. British rulers controlled their political life, and British settlers dominated the agrarian economy, having confiscated most of the land and rented some of it back to Irish tenant farmers. The British landlords were more than economic interests. They were a social and political power. In the 18th century, their power had been so great that they could physically punish Irish peasants who dared not raise a hand in self-defense. They could even send for a peasant's wife or daughter to spend the night with them. Some students of this earlier era have questioned whether there was more than a technical difference between slavery and the subjugation of the Irish peasants. Again, it is unnecessary to decide. 
The severity of the oppression is indicated by the mere fact that such a question could be debated. In earlier centuries, Ireland had been a nation of some accomplishment in crafts and even learning. In pre-Christian times, the Celtic culture was hostile to literacy, although it did use its own version of the Latin alphabet. Ireland was just outside the area of the Roman Empire, and for many centuries it remained on the periphery of Europe, and hence culturally insular as well as politically isolated. Internal dynastic struggles and external invasions repeatedly disrupted Irish life and prevented the emergence of a strong, unified nation. In the early 15th century, the British king's effective control of Ireland extended only along a narrow strip of land about 30 miles long and 20 miles wide on the east coast around Dublin. For centuries, the history of Ireland was a history of sporadic, bloody uprisings and bloody repressions. 600 prisoners were slaughtered by the British on one occasion. Contempt was mixed with antipathy. The Irish were referred to as mere Irish or wild Irish. Even the rare compliment to an Irish leader was in such terms as a great man as savages go. One of the climactic events in Irish history was the Rebellion of 1641, in which thousands of Protestants were massacred, followed by Cromwell's massacre of thousands of Irish Catholics. In the fighting, which lasted for more than a decade, more than half a million people, about 40% of the total population of Ireland, died from war, famine, or disease. The British victory in Ireland was followed by so-called penal laws, depriving the Irish of many basic rights. Irish Catholics could neither vote nor be elected to public office, nor practice law, nor be a student or faculty member at a university. Irish Catholic children could not be educated legally, nor could Catholic churches function freely and openly, nor could Catholics own any significant property or exercise basic legal or political rights. The openly avowed purpose of these laws was to keep the Irish subjugated and impoverished. In the words of the great statesman Edmund Burke, the penal laws in Ireland constituted a machine of as wise and elaborate contrivance for the impoverishment and degradation of the people and the debasement in them of human nature itself, as ever proceeded from the perverted ingenuity of man. The British conquerors were much more successful in keeping the Irish poor than in destroying their resistance. Clandestine grassroots organizations of all sorts developed among the Irish to serve their religious, educational, and political needs. Catholic priests often went underground to serve their parishioners. Schools were secretly conducted, and vigilantes struck, struck against those forcibly collecting tithes among Catholics to support Protestant churches, against landlords evicting tenants, or against indigenous Irishmen collaborating with the enemy. Not only did the Irish develop considerable organizing skills from having to provide themselves with a range of institutions normally provided by the government, they developed skills in circumventing governmental institutions that they regarded as illegitimate oppressions. Both kinds of skills were later to prove useful in the development of Irish political power in America. The oppressive penal laws were relaxed in the later 18th century, and finally repealed in 1829, largely due to the political genius of Daniel O'Connell, who organized the Catholics and eventually left the British little choice other than to repeal or civil war. Oh, sorry, other than repeal or civil war. The term Catholic emancipation has been applied to the repeal of these laws, and its historic significance may be suggested by the fact that the event was celebrated even in the United States, where the Liberty Bell was cracked by its ringing on that occasion. The Irish were not simply a lower class in the sense of being people with less wealth or education. Their position was more caste-like in the sense that no efforts or even achievements would lift them to a plane of equality with others in the society as it was structured. Indeed, so inappropriate were higher-level positions considered for them that law and custom combined to impede any such rise. Moreover, the property rights system in Ireland, whether by intention or design, undermined the initiative of Irish tenant farmers by making any improvements they made on the land the property of the landowner. 
The moral and economic impact of all this reached well beyond the time and place of these laws. Like other groups who went through generations under conditions in which they had little to gain or lose from their own actions, the Irish suffered not only the immediate losses from these laws, but also longer-run losses from a social pattern of reduced initiative. The laziness or improvidence of the Irish became a familiar refrain among contemporaries in Ireland, and later in America, and among sympathizers as well as critics, both scholarly and popular. The point here is not to assign blame, but to recognize a factor that was to have a continuing influence on the history of the Irish immigrants in America. Another feature of life in Ireland was to have a continuing influence after immigration to America. Ireland produced some of the finest whiskey in the world, and the economic and social climate produced ample reasons for drinking it. In the 18th century, when whiskey was cheaper than bread, Drunkenness was common among both the rural and the urban Irish population. Similar alcohol consumption patterns were observed even earlier, however, in Ireland, and would be again among Irish-American immigrants and their descendants. The general poverty of the Irish was sporadically accentuated by crop failures and famines, beginning in the 1830s. At the same time, there began a general increase in emigration, which would eventually cause Ireland to lose a higher proportion of its population this way than any other nation. The climax of these crises was the Great Famine of the 1840s. An international potato blight reached Ireland in 1845, destroying much of the crop that year and in the next few succeeding years. Since one-fourth of the total arable land in Ireland was used for growing potatoes, the effect on the Irish especially the Irish poor, was devastating. A million people died of starvation or starvation-related diseases and epidemics. Even more emigrated. Although altogether, about a third of the total population of Ireland disappeared in a few years in the mid-1840s. By 1914, the population of Ireland was one-half what it had been in the 1840s. The magnitude of the population loss was matched by the magnitude of the misery of the immigration process. The bulk of the immigrants to the United States came in the hold of cargo ships, ships built with little or no regard for the needs of passengers. There were no toilet facilities, for example, so that filth, odor, and disease were common. Each emigrant was given a shelf to sleep on, three feet wide and six feet long, still reeking from the ineradicable stench left by the emigrants of the last voyage. And these shelves were stacked up with just over two feet of space between them. About half the ships took on ordinary river water for drinking, and it was often brackish or muddy. Less than 2% of the ships had a medical officer on board. Most ships made no effort to segregate the sexes, and women were so vulnerable to molestation at night that many slept sitting up on their bundles of belongings rather than lie down on the shelves. Inadequate food, water, and sanitation made ocean crossings dangerous to health and life. In the most disastrous year of all, 1847, about 20% of the huge famine immigration died en route to America or upon landing. This was about 40,000 dead, mostly young people in the prime of life. By comparison, the loss of life among slaves transported from Africa in British vessels in the 19th century was about 9%. While no other year was nearly so bad as 1847, epidemics of typhus, cholera, and other fatal diseases broke out repeatedly and unpredictably, and shipwrecks were sufficiently common that more than 40 emigrant ships went down in the Atlantic in the 1850s. Irish Immigrants in America the Irish who came to America came from a country where more than four-fifths of the population were rural, where even the urban areas were mostly tiny villages, and where most communities were simply clusters and scatters of mud cabins on every plain and hillside. The country lacked coal and iron, essential to modern industry, and the economic policies of the British government had the effect of inhibiting or destroying whatever other industries Ireland could develop. Some idea of the general British attitude toward the Irish may be shown by the fact 
that food continued to be shipped from Ireland to England during the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s. Although the cost of a trip to the United States in the hold of a cargo vessel was less than 10 pounds sterling, less than $50 at contemporary exchange rates, the poorest of the Irish could not afford even that, so that immigration was very low from the poorest fourth of the Irish population. Those a notch above them on the economic scale emigrated in large numbers, often by selling their belongings, using up savings, and spending money sent by relatives already in America. From one-third to three-quarters of the Irish immigration to America in the 1830s and 1840s was financed by money sent from North America. Although the immigrants from Ireland were not the very poorest by Irish standards, they were destitute by American standards. They generally had virtually no money beyond their passage fare, and so settled in the American ports of debarkation, notably Boston and New York, and usually not far from where the ships docked. The Irish immigrants typically lacked any skill of use in an urban economy, and were wholly unacquainted with the essentials of urban living. Still, they had some advantages. Most of them spoke English, the native Irish language Gaelic having died out under British rule. Probably more than half were literate, and they were familiar with Anglo-Saxon institutions which had been imposed on them. They had also developed their own ability to organize politically, and had a cadre of trusted social and political leaders in their priests, who had been forced to acquire experience with secular organization as a result of the persecution that the Catholic Church had suffered, along with the Irish people. Moreover, the Irish had a sense of identity and cohesion as a people oppressed by foreigners in their native land. Unlike more tentative immigration patterns in which the men go first and later send for their wives and children, the 19th century immigration, sorry, the 19th century Irish immigration was of whole families, generally a sign of permanent commitment from the outset. They had already made the decision to become Americans when they got on the boat. The Scotch-Irish. The first emigrants from Ireland before the famines of the 1830s and 1840s were predominantly the Protestant settlers of Scottish ancestry in Ulster County, the Scotch-Irish, as they called themselves in America, to distinguish themselves from the later Celtic immigrants. The Scotch-Irish immigration began in colonial America, was much smaller than the later immigration of the indigenous Irish, and included many more skilled workers, small businessmen, and educated people. Still, it was basically an immigration of people of modest means, and many financed their voyage by agreeing to work as indentured servants for a number of years after arrival to repay fares advanced by prospective employers or shipping companies. The Scotch-Irish settled in a long band running roughly south from central Pennsylvania through the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and into the Piedmont region of the Carolinas. Much of this was frontier territory when the Scotch-Irish settled it, and they became famous as front frontiersmen and Indian fighters. The historic concentration of the Scotch-Irish in these areas is still apparent even in the 20th century. Two of the counties in the Shenandoah Valley claim to have more Presbyterians than all other denominations put together and their telephone books have so many names beginning with Mac that they are listed in a separate category instead of under M. The Scotch-Irish tended to be independent farmers, but not plantation owners or slaveholders. Indeed, the few areas of anti-slavery thought in the antebellum South, oh, of anti-slavery thought in the antebellum South included those where the Scotch-Irish were concentrated. Abraham Lincoln's family came from such an area. For all their fame as fighters and drinkers, the Scotch-Irish were also builders of churches and schools wherever they went. Both traditions went back to Scotland, which had one of the most widely educated populations of any country in Europe. As time passed, the Scotch-Irish were absorbed into the general American population, except in isolated settlements where they formed a large majority. But there was no self-conscious movement to maintain their ethnic identity as among the later Celtic-Irish immigrants. 
Still, enough ethnic identity remained among enough of the Scotch-Irish to bring them into repeated conflict with the Irish Catholics in the 19th century, recreating in the United States their bitter historic conflict in Ireland. Orange Day, the celebration of the victory of William of, or William of Orange over the Catholics in Ireland, was a source of annual conflict in the United States, as the Scotch-Irish tried to hold public celebrations and the Celtic-Irish tried to stop them. Nearly 50 people lost their lives in one Orange Day clash in 1871. At various times and places, the state militia or the federal troops had to be called out to stop battles between the two groups. Sometimes in American history, the earlier immigrants from a given country have helped ease the adjustments of their later arriving fellow countrymen. Nothing of this sort was possible between the Scotch-Irish and, and their Celtic fellow Irishmen, partly because of their different geographic distribution, but more fundamentally because of the bitter hostility between them brought over from the Old World. The Irish immigrants had to make it entirely on their own. The Irish Immigrant Generation Eventually, the very term Irish, or Irish-American, came to mean only those people of indigenous or Celtic Irish ancestry, not the Scotch-Irish. More than half of the Irish were concentrated in four states, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. The sum total of the Irish-Americans exceeded the total population of Ireland. There were more Irishmen in New York than in Dublin. Altogether, more than four million people emigrated from Ireland to the United States in the 19th century. But there were not only about 85,000 Irishmen, sorry, but there were only about 85,000 Irishmen in the whole South. The Irish were not only concentrated geographically in the Northeast, they were overwhelmingly urban in America, as they had been overwhelmingly rural in Ireland. More than four-fifths lived in urban communities. The building of roads, canals, and railroads eventually took large numbers out of the Irish out of the few big cities in which they were concentrated and spread them out in smaller communities along the roots, the roots of these arteries. Some of these communities, in fact, originated as shantytowns occupied by the Irish workmen. Irishmen who joined the army sometimes settled near the military outposts from which they were discharged. Sorry, near the military posts from which they were discharged. But organized attempts to spread the Irish out into the agricultural countryside were generally unsuccessful. American agriculture on large isolated farms, especially on the frontier, was radically different from growing potatoes on small plots in close-knit little communities in Ireland. Aside from the great differences in the skills needed and in the harsher American climate, the isolation implied by most American farming was foreign to the gregarious Irish, and a separation from other Irishmen would have meant for many a loss of the opportunity to attend a Catholic church. Despite numerous appeals and campaigns extending into the 20th century, the American Irish remained a largely urban people. As the Irish crowded into the northeastern urban centers, a pattern unfolded that was to be seen again and again with many later groups. Homes originally intended for single families were subdivided into tiny apartments into which many large families were crowded. Cellars and attics were also turned into dwellings. Makeshift housing was constructed in alleys, such living patterns reflected not only the poverty of the Irish, but also their being used to squalid living conditions in mud huts in Ireland. Cleanliness was neither a cultural value nor a reasonable possibility for people forced to work at dirty jobs and lacking access to indoor running water. Sewage piled up in backyard privies unt until the municipal authorities chose to collect it, or else it ran off in open trenches, fouling the air and providing breeding grounds for dangerous diseases. The importance of proper garbage disposal to keep the neighborhood from being overrun with rats was one of many similar facts of urban life that every rural group new to the city would have to learn over the years, beginning with the Irish and continuing through many others until the present day. None paid a higher price than the Irish during their period of adjustment. Cholera 
which had been unknown before, swept through Boston in 1849, concentrated almost exclusively in Irish neighborhoods. In New York, cholera was also disproportionately observed in Irish wards. In various cities, both tuberculosis and fire swept regularly through the overcrowded tenements where the Irish lived, and there was also a high rate of insanity among the Irish immigrants during the difficult early years of adjustment. The incidence of tuberculosis in Boston varied closely with the proportion of Irish living in a neighborhood. Patterns of alcoholism and fighting brought over from Ireland persisted in the United States. Over half the people arrested in New York in the 1850s were Irish, usually for drunken or disorderly behavior, rather than for serious crimes. Police vans became known as paddy wagons because the prisoners in them were so often Irish. The fighting Irish was a phrase that covered everything from individual brawls to mass melees known as Donnybrooks for a town in Ireland to criminal gangs and terrorist organizations like the Molly Maguires, who murdered and dynamited on a mass scale in Pennsylvania until 20 of their leaders were hanged in 1876. Irish neighborhoods were tough neighborhoods in cities around the country. The Irish Sixth Ward in New York was known as the Bloody Old Sixth. Another Irish neighborhood in New York was known as Hell's Kitchen, and another as San Juan Hill, because of the battles fought there. In Milwaukee, the Irish section was the Irish section was called the Bloody Third. In New Orleans, the area called Irish Channel was long notorious as one of the tougher parts of the city. Where the Irish workers built the Illinois Central Railroad, pe people spoke of a murder a mile as they laid the track. The largest riot in American history was by predominantly Irish rioters in New York in 1863. Angry at the Civil War military draft, which bore more heavily on working class people like themselves, the Irish rioted for several days, killing a thousand people in the process. But although the Irish were prominent, and perhaps paramount, in violence, they were by no means unique. Mass violence was common in 19th century America and the Irish were among its victims as anti-Catholic rioters invaded their neighborhoods to burn churches and homes and to attack people. The Irish put many efforts into self-improvement. Temperance societies struggled with the age-old problem of drink. Emigrant aid societies provided services designed to shield new arrivals from schemers trying to defraud them of their small sums of money. The Catholic Church was active on many fronts, from education to charity to opposing terrorist organizations that others were afraid to oppose. With all these efforts, the economic rise and social acceptance of the Irish were still slow. A state census in 1855 showed that one-fourth of the Irish working in New York City were domestic servants and another fourth laborers and, others, uh, and other unskilled workers. In Boston, almost two-thirds of the Irish were either unskilled workers or domestic servants. Similar occupational patterns were found in Milwaukee, St. Louis, Detroit, New Orleans, and other cities. No other contemporary immigrant group was so concentrated at the bottom of the economic ladder. Even the proportion of the black population who were laborers and house servants in Boston in 1850 was much lower than among the Irish and the free blacks in mid-century Boston were in general economically better off than the Irish. The Irish were prominent not only in unskilled work, but also in hard, dirty, and dangerous work, such as coal mining and the building of railroads and canals. Malaria was so common among canal diggers that it became known as canal fever. Cholera and dysentery were also common and deadly. Railroad building had so many fatalities that it was said that there was an Irishman buried under every tie. In the pre-Civil War South, Irish laborers were often used, to, used in work considered too dangerous for slaves, who represented a sizable capital investment. The jobs that the Irish immigrants held were not simply hard, dirty, and dangerous, they were also unsteady, as unskilled work often was and is. Once a canal or railroad had been built, the workers were out of a job, 
The same was true of many other construction jobs, seasonal work, and casual occupations. The Irish women's work, as domestic servants and washerwomen, was usually more steadily available than that of Irishmen, a situation later to be repeated among blacks. As in Ireland itself, the poverty and improvidence of the Irish immigrants in America often reduced them to living on charity when hard times came. In early 19th century Ireland, even before the famine, it was common for whole families of the poor to go tramping about for months, begging from parish to parish. Recourse to public charity was a well-established habit carried over to America. Expenditures for relief to the poor in Boston more than doubled from 1845 to 1855 during the heavy influx of the Irish after such expenditures had, be had been relatively stable for years. In New York City, in the same era, about 60% of the people in almshouses had been born in Ireland. As late as 1906, there were more Irish than Italian paupers, beggars, and inmates of alm almshouses. Even though the Italians arrived a generation later and were generally poorer at the, tur at the turn of the century. Radically different attitudes toward accepting charity existed in Ireland and Italy, and these attitudes apparently had more effect than their respective objective economic conditions in America. There were similar cultural differences in attitudes toward the abandonment of wives and children. In the 1840s, it was almost automatically assumed that an orphan was Irish. And as late as 1914, about half the Irish families on Manhattan's west side were fatherless. No such pattern appeared among the Italians. But although both contemporary observers and later scholars frequently described the Irish immigrants as thriftless, the Irish also left a remarkable record of donations to the Catholic Church and remittances to family members back in Ireland, all out of very low incomes. Money from America paid the fares of most of those who immigrated during the famine of the 1840s and from 1848 to 1864, Irish Americans sent $65 million to Ireland. The Irish could and did save from their earnings and were generous in donating these savings to their church and their families. Nevertheless, they were not good financial managers over time, nor were they inhibited about resorting to public charity when in distress. The low and precarious economic conditions of the 19th century Irish were reflected in their living conditions, perhaps the worst of any racial or ethnic group in American history. As one account noted, though Jews and Italians lived five and ten to a room in roach-infested, dilapidated, and dark buildings, their conditions do not seem to have been as horrendous as those of the Irish. By the time these later immigrants, and then blacks, reached the big cities, indoor running water was common, even if cold and in a spigot or toilet shared by many families. In the housing available to the early Irish immigrants, there was a complete neglect of sewage and sanitation of any kind. The only water came from hydrants in the backyards, where crude outhouses were also located, perpetually gushing over into the surrounding yards and acting as mighty carriers of disease. Garbage also collected in these yards, which converted the few feet between adjoining buildings into storehouses of accumulated filth. Inside, rooms were small, unpainted, and typically had damp walls and leaky roofs. Repairs went undone for years. Closets, sorry, closets were rare. Belongings were either hung on pegs or simply scattered around. Wash tubs provided whatever cleaning was received by clothes or people, for bathtubs were unheard of. Even attics only three feet high were rented out. It was common in Irish slums for whole families to live in a single room without sunlight or ventilation. The crowding was so great that beds were shared by numerous adults, sometimes wife and husband, brothers and sisters in the same bed. Slum streets were ankle-deep in garbage, and sewage flowed in open trenches. Although the Irish immigrants, like other immigrants, had a disproportionate representation of young people in the prime of life, the mortality rate shot up after their arrival. Boston's mortality rate in 1850 was double that of the rest of Massachusetts, 1.5. 
even though there were relatively fewer aged people in Boston. The difference was due to the extremely high mortality rate in the Irish neighborhoods. Diseases that had become rare in America now flourished again. In 1849, cholera spread through Philadelphia to New York and to Boston, primarily in Irish neighborhoods. There had not been a smallpox epidemic in Boston since 1792, but after 1845, it became a recurring plague, again, primarily among the Irish. The spread of the Irish into other neighborhoods meant, among other things, the spread of these and other diseases. The residential flight of the middle-class Americans from the Irish immigrants was by no means all irrationality. Later Generations the Irish continued to immigrate to the United States in large numbers, even after the catastrophic famines of the 1840s had ended. So there were, and are, first-generation Irish Americans throughout American history. Yet the peak of Irish immigration to the United States was reached in the mid-19th century, and thereafter, second- and third-generation Irish Americans became an ever-larger portion of the total picture. How did these later generations fare? Given the desperate poverty of their immigrant forebears, it may seem inevitable that they rose. And yet, progress is by no means automatic or costless, and many parts of the world remained mired in the same poverty as their ancestors in centuries past. Politics One of the earliest and most spectacular rises of the Irish in America was in politics. Block voting of the Irish in the big cities where they were often the largest single group, assured them political influence, evident as early as the 1830s. But the political success of the Irish went far beyond this, including outright control of municipal political machines in many cities for many decades, long after other ethnic groups arrived and formed a numerical majority of the electorate. In Boston, Irish mayors began being elected in the 1880s. In New York at the same time, the Irish were in control of the, of the Tammany political machine, an organization from which they had once been excluded in the early 19th century. Similar Irish political domination occurred in contemporary Chicago, Buffalo, Milwaukee, San Francisco, and other cities. This Irish domination of American big city politics continued on into the 20th century, including to the present day in some cities. Irish political bosses included many picturesque, legendary figures, from John F. Fitzgerald, Honey Fitz, singing mayor of 19th century Boston, and grandfather of President John F. Kennedy, to Richard J. Daley, mayor of 20th century Chicago for more than 20 years. Many were charming, beloved rogues, such as New York's boss, Big Tim Sullivan, a warm-hearted giant who collected graft from many sources, and distributed food and clothes to the poor, and whose funeral, in 1913, was attended by 25,000 people. In a similar mold was James Michael Curley, who was mayor of Boston four times, a congressman for two terms, and governor of Massachusetts, as well as serving two terms in prison. The Irish did not simply take over the conventional apparatus of politics. They transformed American municipal politics. They changed the class composition of municipal government, putting the reins of power in the hands of men who had risen from the working class and often from the slums. Moreover, the Irish political machines were accessible to people still in the working class and the slums, accessible not only to those seeking political careers, but accessible more broadly to members of the great urban masses who needed help in getting a job, or naturalization papers, or food or fuel to last through an emergency. The bewildering bureaucracies, regulations, and red tape confronting the poor and undereducated could be made responsive, or could be circumvented through the episodic interventions of political bosses. The earlier history of the Irish in Ireland provided them with both the skills and the attitudes required to operate outside the official rules while adhering to a separate, informal code of conduct. The Irish brought to America a settled tradition of regarding the formal government as illegitimate and the informal one as bearing the true impress of popular sovereignty. 
Bribery, violence, and vote fraud were prominent features of the Irish political machines. However, they were not chaotic, but highly organized and controlled. Irish political machines were built on loyalty to individuals and to the organization. Their guiding principle was the pragmatic desire to be elected, not any ideological program. The goals of the political machines have been the prerequisites of power, salary, graft, and the ability to appoint followers and favorites to sought-after jobs. These jobs included not only the exalted positions, but also many less spectacular posts still considered highly desirable by low-income people. Policemen, firemen, clerks, school teachers, and other municipal jobs that were largely appointed appointive in 19th century municipalities. For example, in 1855, nearly 40% of New York, City's, New York City's policemen were immigrants, and about three-fourths of these immigrants were Irish. By the late 19th century, the police forces and fire departments of all major American cities were controlled by Irish Americans. What tied these municipal political organizations together was neither philosophy nor a social vision, but the quid pro quo. Voters who loyally supported the machines could turn to it for help in times of trouble, which might cover anything from a threatened eviction to petty criminal charges to a need to avenge some insult. The businessmen who made contributions to the party or paid graft to the political boss could expect municipal regulations to be relaxed or his violations to be overlooked, and city contracts were more likely to come his way. The rank-and-file followers of the political boss could expect their years of getting out of, could expect their years of getting out the vote, looking out for local constituents, and otherwise doing the bidding of the leader to be duly rewarded with slow but steady promotions up the hierarchy. Reciprocal loyalty was the key. The highly controlled hierarchy of, po of machine politics meant that each individual had to wait his turn for advancement, a pattern common in Ireland, where waiting patiently and unmarried to inherit the family farm was the custom. This also meant that whoever was at the top could stay at the top for many years, often for life. In its heyday, the Tammany machine in New York had just three leaders in half a century, all Irish. In Brooklyn, one man, also Irish, headed the machine for more than 40 years, followed by another Irish man who ruled for a quarter of a century until his death. In the Bronx, another Irish machine leader was in control for more than 30 years until his death. Similar longevity was common in Irish political machines in Chicago. Even more remarkable than such individual longevity was the even greater longevity of Irish political machines, long after the Irish were outnumbered by the other immigrant groups that came to America by the millions in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was common for the Irish machines to continue in power, not only in the city as a whole, but even for Irish politicians to represent neighborhoods that were predominantly Italian or Jewish or other ethnic groups. For example, the 19th Ward in turn-of-the-century Chicago was about four-fifths Italian, but was represented for years by an Irish politician named Johnny Powers. Only after many years did the Irish politicians find it necessary to admit Jews and Italians to even low-ranking jobs in their political organizations. It was the, the 1890s before ambitious young Jews were beginning to be accepted as Tammany hangers-on, messengers, and flunkies. As late as 1907, Tammany had only one Jewish district leader. Similarly, in Chicago and Boston, Italians were belatedly and grudgingly given low-level jobs, becoming small cogs in the ward machine, and being placed in ambiguous and compromising positions as go-betweens between their own people and the Irish political bosses. Attempts of Italian and Jewish Americans to gain political control of their own communities were repeatedly beaten back by the more politically experienced Irish on into the early 20th century. The Irish had a number of advantages in political competition. First, they had a strong sense of group solidarity, going back for centuries in Ireland, 
where they had been a persecuted people in their own land. Jews and Italians had many more internal divisions, also pointing to their experience in Europe in centuries past. The Irish also had the advantage of arriving in America decades earlier, speaking English, and having a history of political awareness and organizational experience, even if clandestine. Finally, the culture of the Irish was one, one in which personal charm and fluency with words were highly valued, obviously great assets in politics and in other areas where personality and articulation are important, such, a, such as law, show business, the labor movement, journalism, and the priesthood, all areas where the Irish also became very successful. The Irish were by no means the originators of corrupt politics. They were simply more successful at it, and performed with a warmer human touch. No small part of their success was due to the insensitivity of their political opponents to the desires and fears of the immigrant masses in the cities. Political reform movements were typically in the hands of upper-income, more educated people with values, goals, and styles very different from those of the working-class voters. Reform politicians typically had neither personal nor organizational roots in the low-income communities, so that even when they acted on behalf of the poor, it was with little mutual understanding and much unintended harm. The poor usually ended up preferring corrupt politicians, who understood them, to distant theorists who did not. The advantages of indigenous political leaders from within the immigrant communities still do not explain why they should be specifically Irish, long after great numbers of Jewish, Italian, Polish, etc. people constituted the bulk of the urban masses. The Irish advantages included speaking English, and often speaking it eloquently, even when ungrammatically. The Irish were also unique among peoples from a peasant background in having had a history of political and organizational experience in Europe, in maintaining underground religious organizations and terrorist organizations. Other peasant masses, in Italy or Poland, for example, also suffered oppression, but not in the particular form that would make the Irish kind of underground activity an effective response. For example, the oppressors of Italian peasants were other Italians, not a different race with a different religion. The issue of race, religion, or country did not exist as an emotional nucleus for group solidarity. Among the Jews scattered through Europe, religion, culture, and race were factors promoting solidarity. But the Jews were so hopelessly outnumbered and isolated in each country that it would have been suicidal for them to engage in the kind of resistance and terrorism applied by the Irish, who were a large majority in their own country. In short, no other immigrant group had either the historical or the organizational experience of the Irish or their gift for words and human relations, as demonstrated in many other fields besides politics. In an era when religious differences were fiercely divisive, the Irish had the political advantage over other Catholic immigrants of being committed to the American principle of separation of church and state. They had lived under a state-established church, the Anglican Church, in Ireland and had found it repellent. Other Catholics from countries with state-established churches had a very different experience and tradition, for there it was their own church that was established. While it was no political advantage to, be, to the Irish to be Catholic in Protestant America, their particular political view of church-state relations made them less politically vulnerable than other Catholics. While there were nativists who raised alarms about the dangers of the Pope taking over the United States politically, such alarms had little to feed on in Irish-American theory or practice and lost credibility over time. Such accusations were resurrected against Al Smith in his 1928 bid for the presidency, but the great number of successful Irish Catholic candidates for other offices makes this less than a decisive example. Smith himself had, of course, been elected to other offices, including governor of New York, by a largely Protestant electorate. John F. Kennedy's election as president in 1960 marked the death knell of a, polit of a political tactic that was already moribund. Irish political machines have almost invariably been of the Democratic Party, going ba far back into the 19th century. <clears throat> The Irish districts voted overwhelmingly Democratic, more so than any other ethnic group. 
other groups split their votes among the Whigs or the emerging Republican Party. In the 1850s, there arose yet another political party, the American Party, better known as Know Nothings, based on opposition to immigrants in general and the Irish in particular. The Know Nothings were initially a secret order from which the American Party developed as a political arm. Nativist hostility to foreigners went back before this particular movement, but by the 1830s, such hostility appeared to be dying out. However, a great and sustained increase in immigration rekindled nativist feeling. Immigration to the United States had been well below 10,000 persons per year prior to the 1840s, but soared over 100,000 in 1842, over 200,000 in 1847, and over 400,000 in 1854. The Irish were the largest single group of immigrants, and in many of the years of the 1840s and the 1850s, over half the immigrants to the United States came from Ireland. The Irish were considered not merely to be foreigners, but an unassimilable group. In an argument destined to be repeated many times about many groups, it was claimed that although earlier immigrants could be absorbed into the mainstream of American life, the particular characteristics of this group made that impossible. The nativist attack on foreigners, centering on the Irish, cited their political corruption, their low standard of living, which was seen as a threat to the living standards of Native American workers. Of Native American workers. And their overrepresentation among people in jail and receiving public charity. That the Irish were overwhelmingly Catholic was to become and remain a central source of discord, especially in the 19th century, when religious differences were very serious matters, politically and socially. One small but significant indication of the social importance of religious differences was that the intermarriage rate of the Irish in Boston in the 1860s was the lowest of all the immigrant groups, even lower than black-white intermarriage rates at the same period. The Know Nothings rode a rising tide of nativist feeling to spectacular political successes. Advocating tighter controls on immigration and naturalization, the Know Nothings in 1855 elected six governors and controlled several state legislatures, as well as electing numerous congressmen. Their decline was, however, almost as swift as their rise. One of the problems was that northern and southern branches of the party could not agree on the issue of slavery. The Know Nothings were, on most issues, a reform party, and the Irish were opposed to most reforms. The Irish sought to rise in the existing system, not to change it fundamentally. Democrats in general were, in this era, defenders of the status quo, while Whigs, Republicans, and the short-lived know-nothings were in favor of a variety of reforms, ranging from limitations on alcohol consumption to women's suffrage to the containment or abolition of slavery. Part of their hostility to the Irish was due to the fact that the Irish were seen as obstacles to the achievement of many reforms and social experiments. Economic Advancement The spectacular success of Irish politicians in 19th century American cities was by no means reflected in the economic conditions of contemporary Irish Americans as a whole. As late as in 1890, 42% of the Irish were servants, and many of the others remained in unskilled labor. In Boston in 1890, while 4% of Native Americans, and here the N is lowercase and the A is uppercase, and I assume he's speaking, he's not speaking of Native American Indians when he says that. <clears throat> in Boston in 1890, while 4% of Native Americans and 5% of Germans worked in the professions Less than one-tenth of one percent of the Irish had such occupations. While 31 percent of the Native Americans did high-level, white-collar work, only six percent of the Irish had advanced that far. But although the economic conditions of the Irish compared unfavorably with some other groups, they were rising. Despite pronounced similarities between the Irish and the Negroes in mid-century Boston, later generations of the Irish pulled ahead of blacks in skilled and white-collar occupations. Still, the Irish were the slowest rising of the European ethnic groups. With socioeconomic rise came internal differentiation. Some remained shanty Irish, 
mired in poverty and squalor, while others became lace curtain Irish, seeking amenities and respectability. The influx of new Irish immigrants continued to begin at the bottom of the economic ladder, but many of the second-generation Irish moved up from the positions held by their fathers. For example, while only 10% of first-generation Irishmen in Boston held white-collar jobs in 1890, nearly 40% of the second-generation Irish had achieved that at the same time. Conversely, while two-thirds of the older generation ended their careers as unskilled and semi-skilled workers, at the same time, only about one-third of their second-generation contemporaries ended their careers in such positions. As the Irish rose slowly through manual and white-collar occupations, many of their places at the bottom of the economic ladder were taken by members of other groups that now constituted the bulk of the massive new immigration to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe after the Civil War. After the Civil War. A whole pattern of ecological succession was set in motion, with later arriving groups, notably the Italians, slowly replacing the Irish in hard, dirty, and dangerous occupations, and moving into the slums as the Irish began moving out. By 1910, the proportion of the Italians who were unskilled and semi-skilled laborers in Boston was precisely the same as that of the Irish 20 years earlier. Where the Irish had been slum tenants with Anglo-Saxon landlords, now there were increasingly Italian tenants with Irish slum landlords. Where the older Americans had once fled as the Irish moved into their neighborhoods, now the Irish fled as blacks, Jews, and Italians moved in. Where the Irish children had once been taught by Anglo-Saxon teachers, now increasingly Irish school teachers taught children who were Jewish or Italian. Where the Irish immigrants had once been used as strike breakers against unionized native workers, now Italian or black workers were used as strike breakers against unionized Irish workers. <clears throat> the pattern of ethnic ecological succession did not mean a complete repetition of one group's history in another group. Some groups moved upward at a faster pace than others. The Jews, for example, arrived in the United States with even less money than the Irish, initially earned less than their Irish contemporaries, but then overtook and outdistanced the Irish in income, occupation, and education. Moreover, there were numerous group differences, not only in the pace of economic advancement, but also in the channels through which advancement took place. The Irish advanced in politics, banking, union leadership, sports and journalism. The Jews in business ownership, skilled trades, scholarship, and science. The Irish seldom advanced through business entrepreneurship. Even though the Boston Irish had higher incomes than the Jews in that city in 1909, the Jews were nine times more heavily represented among businessmen, even if, at that time, many of these businesses were petty peddling from pushcarts and the like. Where the first-generation Irish in their poverty became domestic servants and heavy, unskilled laborers, Jews sought other kinds of low-level jobs, jobs that permitted them to acquire a skill or learn to operate on their own business later on, to operate their own business later on. Italians also went into business more often than the Irish. Even in Irish-dominated Boston, not a single important office of the Chamber of Commerce was held by an Irishman as late as 1929. There have been some highly successful businesses found by Irish-Americans, founded by Irish-Americans, such as the Grace Steamship Lines and Irish Americans invented the sorry and Irish Americans invented the O'Sullivan rubber heel and the hurricane lamp for use on railroads. However, the kinds of businesses in which the Irish have done well have typically been businesses such as banking, where there is stress on personal qualities and the accommodation of conflicting interests, and not a little involvement in politics. Bars and saloons are also businesses requiring a human touch, and the Irish have thrived in such businesses. But by and large, the Irish have not been especially outstanding in the field of science and invention. The areas in which the Irish met their greatest success, and the channels through which the mass of, I of the Irish advanced, were typically areas not requiring either business entrepreneurship or scholarly education. Neither of these were part of their history in Ireland, nor did they become prominent in the Irish-American pattern. The ancient Celtic culture was hostile to literacy, 
and Ireland, and Ireland was the only major Western nation that did not build a single university during the Middle Ages. Even a sympathetic historian of the Irish acknowledged that there had, has been almost no intellectual tradition among them. Against this background, it is perhaps not surprising that early 20th century Irish youngsters in New York finished high school at a rate less than one hundredth that of youngsters from a German or Jewish background. At this point in history, the Irish were by no means underprivileged underprivileged vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, either economically or in terms of political power. Nor was the difference one of ability, for as late as World War I, Irish, Irish soldiers scored substantially higher on mental tests than did Jewish soldiers. The importance of education was simply seen very differently by the two cultures, and had been for centuries. This apparently had more weight than the immediate objective circumstances, which at this point were all in favor of the Irish compared to the Jews. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Irish in Boston had higher incomes than the Jews, smaller families to support, and a higher rate of literacy, in addition to being dominant in politics. As late as 1950, Irish immigrants had the edge in education over Jewish immigrants, but the children of the Jewish immigrants went on to college more than twice as often as, that of, as the children of Irish immigrants. Many Irish Americans rose to prominence in sports and entertainment, a pattern to be repeated by later ethnic groups living in poverty and without an, without an intellectual or entrepreneurial tradition. There were idolized actors named Tyrone Power in both the 19th and 20th centuries, father and son, famous singers from John McCormack to Bing Crosby, and sports heroes from John L. Sullivan to John J. McGraw to Gene Tunney and The Gipper. The Irish dominated some sports, such as boxing, baseball, and track, but were not nearly as prominent in swimming or wrestling. The Irish distribution among sports was also a pattern later to be repeated by blacks. In the 19th century, it was usually a foregone conclusion that the heavyweight champion of the world would be Irish. Jack Kilrain, John L. Sullivan, and Gentleman Jim Corbett being the best known. In the 20th century, Irish-American heavyweight champions included Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney, and ended with James J. Braddock, whose loss of the title to Joe Louis marked, Louis or Louis? marked the beginning of ethnic succession in boxing. The early Irish Americans were so successful in boxing and baseball that non-Irish boxers and ball players often took Irish names to help their careers. <clears throat> Although scholarship was not a feature of Irish traditions, the use of words has been. Even among the mass of poor and uneducated Irish in both Ireland and America, pride in the expressive use of words has been common, whether called a gift of gab a talent for aphorism, or plain blarney. Many famous writers come from this background, from journalists like Peter Finley Dunn, creator of Mr. Dooley, David G. Crowley, editor of the famous New York World, and sports writer John Kiernan, to novelists and playwrights from John O'Hara to Eugene O'Neill. The point here is not to praise or blame whole peoples, nor even to rank or grade their performances. The point is much more general, to assess the role of enduring cultural values compared to more immediate, objective conditions. Intergroup Relations Despite the ability of Irish politicians to win the votes of other ethnic groups in the 19th century, the general relations between the Irish populace and other groups were typically far from harmonious. Perhaps the worst relations between any two groups in American history have been between the Irish and the Negroes. Chronic animosity between them erupted into numerous fights and riots for more than a century in cities across the country, both at work and in the slums they often shared. The famous draft riots of New York in 1863 saw rampaging Irishmen lynching Negroes on sight, often mutilating them and even burning down an orphanage for black children. The first blacks to move into Harlem were middle-class Negroes who left the black enclave in mid-Manhattan around the turn of the century to get away from the Irish living nearby. The Irish had similar relations with other groups whose skins were white, 
In addition to their many bloody clashes with the Scotch-Irish, they were also involved in numerous riots and street battles against the Germans, violence against the Italians in various cities, and attacks on Jewish property, persons, and burial grounds in Boston and New York. On the West Coast, the Irish led both physical assaults and political attacks on the 19th century Chinese immigrants. The usual difficulties of determining the initiator of hostilities are not so great in some of these instances. Some of the groups with whom the Irish had numerous clashes were groups that lived relatively harmoniously with other groups. For example, the Jews and the Italians generally lived peaceably with each other, although neither could get along with the Irish. The Chinese Americans seldom, if ever, attacked any other ethnic group. The historic hostility between blacks and the Irish goes back well before the Civil War, at a time when there was only a handful, a relative handful of free blacks, and it would have been suicidal for them to have launched unprovoked attacks on the numerous Irish. Germans sometimes initiated conflicts with the Irish, but on other occasions, Irish rowdies interfered with German picnics, frequently, for no apparent reason, except to add excitement to an otherwise dull Sunday. The era when Irish immigration peaked in the 1840s and 1850s was an era when violence peaked in American cities, and not merely because of the Irish. Often, mobs of nativists rampaged into Irish neighborhoods, attacking individuals and burning down homes and churches. The general level of violence in the country was high. Violence was not the only form of intergroup hostility involving the Irish. Institutions controlled by the Irish notably municipal politics and the Catholic Church, were institutions in which it was very difficult for the non-Irish to advance. Not only was it difficult for Jews or Italians to advance in the Irish political machines themselves, it was even difficult for them to get city jobs under the patronage, patronage system. Only with the rise of civil service tests did Jews begin replacing the Irish in municipal jobs in New York City. A similar pattern of ethnic preserves was apparent in the Catholic Church, where a priest born in Baltimore of, I of Italian parents, speaking English and Italian equally naturally, will see priests new from Ireland promoted over him because he is a foreigner. Although the Irish were only 17% of the Catholic population, they were 35% of the clergy and 50% of the hierarchy. Over half of all Catholic bishops in the United States from 1789 to 1935 were Irish. Protests by non-Irish Catholics over Irish control of the Church caused the sending of a papal emissary to the United States and the establishment of churches and parochial schools for various ethnic groups, preferably staffed by members of those respective groups. In addition to hostility between the Irish and specified ethnic groups, there developed in later generations a generalized hostility of Irish Americans toward foreigners in general. With the Irish now having acquired a higher standard of living and a degree of respectability, the new immigrants were seen as being as much of a threat to them as they themselves had once been seen by an earlier generation of Americans. Like other patterns found among the Irish in America, Pervasive intergroup conflict seems less traceable to circumstances in the United States than to attitudes or traditions going back to their history in Ireland. The circumstances of the Irish immigrants in the United States were not so very different from those of such later arriving groups as the Italians, who have peacefully coexisted with many very different kinds of other people. In Ireland, however, those whom an Irishman encountered in centuries past could be readily categorized as either one, another Irishman, or two, a bitter enemy, disdainful, persecuting, and often violent. The group identity of the Irish was pronounced before they set foot on American soil. Against this background, it is all the more remarkable that the American Catholic Church, although Irish dominated, has played an important conciliatory role among the various Catholic ethnic groups and even an important role in philanthropic ac activities among Negroes reaching far back in history and continuing on to the present. While the South Boston Irish were rioting over the busing of black school children into their communities, Catholic parochial schools in cities across the country were operating in black neighborhoods, with white, often Irish, priests and nuns 
who were achieving remarkable educational results, far outstripping those in public schools in the same neighborhoods. The Irish Today With the rise of the Irish and their growing social acceptance has come both cultural and biological assimilation, making it difficult to determine precisely who is Irish today. While only about one-tenth of the Irish married outside of their own ethnic group in the 1860s, in the 1960s, just over half of all Irish-American men married women from dif different ethnic backgrounds. The descendants of the original immigrants from Ireland include many who may be classified under other ethnic groups today, or may be part of that half of the American population that cannot identify its ethnicity at all to the census surveyors. Much of the data available on the Irish today are based on individuals who choose to identify themselves to the Census Bureau as Irish, and these may or may not be typical of the descendants of the original immigrants from Ireland. If it is the more upwardly mobile who assimilate more readily, those still readily identifiable as Irish, or Italian, German, etc., may be a residual population, less successful than the larger group from which they came. Even with such reservations, however, it is clear that the Irish have risen from their initial poverty to reach or surpass American standards of income or education. Irish American incomes have been about 5% above the national average in the 1970s. Their years of schooling and their proportions in college are about the same as the U.S. population as a whole. The IQ scores of Irish Americans have been consistently just above the national norm of 100 for the past half century. Alcoholism remains a striking characteristic among the Irish in America, as in Ireland. Various studies show them with rates of alcohol consumption and alcoholic diseases higher than among Negroes, Germans, Italians, Jews, or many other groups. Family size among the Irish is the same as among other Americans, despite popular stereotypes about large Catholic families. Irish Americans number about 16 million people, or about 8% of the total U.S. population. Their voting patterns are now about the same as those of other Americans. With the election of John F. Kennedy to the presidency in 1960, the issue of a Catholic president is dead. The Irish have, in fact, become so Americanized that some lament that they have lost their distinctive qualities. But becoming American can hardly be regarded as a failure. It remains the dream of many around the world, and was the dream of millions who first embarked on the perilous journey from Ireland. <laughs>